Hey, welcome back once again, all you CISSP wannabes. I am Colin Weaver. These are the IT Dojo CISSP questions of the day, where each and every time I come at you, I'm going to bring two questions to help you to continue to prep for your CISSP exam. So, question number one. Which of the following is a key concept that provides for the security of stream ciphers, stream ciphers in modern cryptography? There's your answer choices. Click pause if you need to, look it all over, pick the right answer, then we'll walk through each one. Answer choice number one is digital signatures, and that is not the correct answer. Uh, a digital signature is going to bring uh, some trust to your hashing, to your integrity mechanism, as well as authentication and non-repudiation if they're from a uh, trusted source. So uh, none of those things have anything to do with making stuff secret, though. So uh, that's all about um, you know, origin authentication, non-repudiation, and integrity, whereas stream ciphers are all about confidentiality. So definitely not the right answer here. Choice number two is confusion. And that is the correct answer. Now, confusion as a concept seeks to go in and make any relationships between the plain text and the cipher text as difficult as possible. It should be very confusing. Uh, this should stay true if confusion is implemented well within an algorithm. It should stay true even if the attacker has a large number of plain texts and their corresponding ciphertexts. The way that this is achieved is by going in and making sure mathematically that every bit in the output of the ciphertext is dependent upon not just a portion of the key, but on the entire key. So the entire key is used to influence the output that comes out of the ciphertext bit by bit. And it creates this confusion uh, primarily by going in and substituting values. Okay? And if we look at how this is implemented with an algorithm like RC4, you have the key fed into the algorithm to produce key stream that's then used to, to substitute one value for another doing an exclusive or operation. So that substitution of just taking one value and substituting it for another, we see in very basic mechanisms like the Caesar shift. We also see it, you know, more advanced implementations of it, like with RC4, by going in and uh, implementing it as a stream cipher. But stream ciphers rely upon this confusion or this, this uh, substitution of values for its, their security. Okay. Um, you contrast that with Block ciphers, block ciphers also use substitution, but they also use transposition, which I'll come back to more in a second. But uh, the primary mechanism on how stream ciphers achieve their security is through, uh, is through confusion. And confusion is primarily implemented by going in and doing substitution, substituting one value for another. Next choice on the list says collision resistance. Nope. We already know what the right answer is, so all these other answers are going to be incorrect, but let's make sure that we know why they're not correct. A collision resistance has to deal with hashing. Um, in the world of hashing, if you take two different values and you hash them and they both hash to the same value, we call that a collision. And generally, collisions are bad. We don't want collisions to occur, but the reality is, is that collisions are going to occur. Okay, Pretty much Anything and everything you can think of within a system is hashable. You can hash a single file. You can hash a word. You can hash a single letter. You can hash a group of letters. You can hash a group of words. You can hash a group of files and so on. You can hash an entire hard drive. So um, invariably, it's going to happen that two of something somewhere hash to the same value. Some word, purple, hashes to the same thing as some arbitrary Microsoft Word document that's two megabytes in size. The trick, of course, with that is that... When a collisions occur, we don't generally like that, but the collision also needs to be useful to the attacker because in that circumstance, if, if a word hashes to the same value as a file, there's not a lot of circumstances where you're going to be able to pass one off as the other. Collisions become dangerous when somebody can take, uh, say, one word and have another word hash to the same value. So if the word purple and the word magenta both hash to the same value, that's a problem because if your password was purple, one, your password sucks, two, your password is also magenta. So you wouldn't want to go in and do that. Um, the same thing would happen if, let's say that you had written a document and gone in and digitally signed this document. What if somebody could go in and uh, hash the document 
and then get the modification of the document, which actually has meaning to mislead, uh, get it to hash the exact same value as the original document. Well, then when you went to view the now modified document and you wanted to check the hash before doing so, the hash would compute to the same value, which means that you would trust that this document still had integrity when it doesn't. And that gets even scarier if people can go in and create certificates that they might use on web servers that actually hash to the same values as the real certificates, but they are in fact forged. That's where collisions become very scary. And so having an algorithm that is resistant to that is what collision resistance is all about. And the general way that we accomplish collision resistance is to use hashing algorithms that have longer outputs. Now, there's a very general notion for it, but we've seen it now with MD5 and with SHA-1 and how those two particular algorithms have kind of been pushed off to the side and to, you know, relegated into the history of the way we were instead of us going in and using SHA-2 or SHA-256, SHA-384, SHA-512, and so on. Um, but that's what collision resistance is. Not the right answer here, but you should be aware of what that concept is. Next answer choice is diffusion. Uh, diffusion is not the correct answer. Um, although diffusion and confusion are oftentimes said in the same breath um, as people go in and talk about these concepts, but um, diffusion is a mechanism that can allow us to have better security for block ciphers, but not for stream ciphers. Stream ciphers, again, rely just on confusion in order to achieve their security. Now, if you go read what most books and most places on the internet say about diffusion, they say that it dissipates the redundancy of the plain text across the ciphertext. And after you reread that three or four times, you're like, what? Okay. And it, it basically breaks down like this, that in, say, the English language, we have 26 letters that we use to form words. Now, those words aren't used, excuse me, those letters aren't used equally. And words, for that matter, aren't used equally. Some words get used more often than others. And in some cases, we have patterns that if a particular letter occurs, there's a high degree of likelihood that another letter of a particular type is going to come after it. And then you have ones that are fairly you know, consistent rules where you have like the letter Q in the English language, the letter U is always going to come after that. So um, those create what are referred to as redundancies in our data. And that we can make you know, guesses about what data might be or could be based upon those things. The other thing is that because we're dealing with protocols like Ethernet and TCP IP and, and all these other protocols that are out there, these things have pretty formalized structures. And so we can we can know what certain values are going to be or what are, or certain values are likely to be uh, based upon knowing, say, a, a preceding you know, byte or something like that. So we want to eliminate as much as possible for an attacker to be able to go in and create any correlation between the key and the corresponding ciphertext. And the most common way that this diffusion is achieved is by going in and doing transposition. And transposition is, is basically just jumbling things up. So diffusion goes in and does substitution, and then transposition gives us diffusion by going in and mixing them all up. And, and I use very simplistic examples of, you know, take a plain text word, and then substitute the letters of that word with other letters. And then take that now substituted value and jumble it up, mix all the letters up. Okay, so that's a round of confusion in the form of substitution, followed by a round of diffusion in the form of transposition. And then you can do that over and over and over. You can do a round of substitution and transposition, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one. And after you do it a sufficient number of times, like DES does it 16 times, you can have a reasonable level of security. Now, DES is not secure anymore. We, we know that, but um, that's a different conversation. And so with diffusion, if you go in and you change a bit in the key, it, in essence, creates a 50-50 chance that all the other bits in the output are going to change. Okay. So that's all sometimes referred to as an avalanche effect. You make one little change here, and it causes a dramatic change in the corresponding output. Um, it's not with stream ciphers, but a very easy way for you to go in and see this is to take a, you know, take a text file that has a lot of words in it and hash it and then go change a comma to a period somewhere buried in that document and then hash the uh, file again. And you'll see that the hash is a radically different value. It's not slightly different. It's dramatically different. And the reason, part of the reason that it's dramatically different is because 
there's diffusion in there where a slight change in the corresponding plain text produces a huge change in the corresponding uh, uh, ciphertext. In that case, it's just a hash, but you would see the similar sort of functionality in the way that, um, that a block cipher would be implemented in terms of trying to create a lack of relationship between the two. Next answer choice on the list is uh, entropy. Uh, no, again, we already know the right answer, but entropy is not what we're looking for here. Um, entropy, th that the word entropy gets used in a lot of different ways. Um, here we're talking about entropy in the form of, I, I like to kind of reword it into a very common question, which would be how many guesses on average would it take me in order to figure out a particular value? And um, if, if you look at how much entropy there is in a system, the, the, more, the more randomness there is, the, the higher the entropy, um, or the more unpredictability there is, the more entropy there is. And uh, this has very uh, specific impacts when we deal with things like password entropy. Uh, I'll put a link down in the bottom of, a, of an article I wrote on password entropy that you can go look at on my website. It's a very, very fascinating topic, but uh, entropy is not what we're looking for right here in terms of how that works. And the final choice on the list is asymmetry. No, also not what we're looking for. Um, asymmetry by itself doesn't really mean anything except for the fact that there's no symmetry. You put the letter A in front of something and then the word, it means the A means without. So asymmetry means without symmetry. But this doesn't say anything about whether it's as asymmetric keys or anything like that. It's just the word asymmetry by itself. So no, that's just there to distract you. So definitely not something that we're interested in. All right, let's move on to question number two. It is, which of the following is true regarding the use of RAID 6? There's some answer choices. I want to know which of them is true. So click pause if you need to, then click play, and we can talk it through. First answer choice says that you need six disks to do RAID 6. That's not true. You need four disks to do RAID 6 at a bare minimum. You can totally do it with six, but at a minimum, you have to have four. Okay, so um, not that answer. How about answer choice number two? It says that if you're using RAID 6, you can have two simultaneous uh, drive failures. Yup, that's one of the big shiny things about RAID 6 that makes it so interesting is that un, it, you know, RAID 1, RAID 5 can't do that stuff, uh, but RAID 6 can. So if you have two drives fail at the same time, a RAID 6 array will stay running. If you have a third drive fail, I hope you have good backups, but if two fail, it'll still work. So uh, RAID 5 can only survive one disk or one drive failing at a time. All right, we have the right answer, but let's look at the other ones. Next answer choice says that it has a net cost of one drive to store the parity data. <sighs> no, it has a net cost of two. Okay, so if you have 10 drives in your RAID 6 array, you're going to lose effectively the, the sum total of two of those drives to be able to store your parity. With something like RAID, you lose the net total of one, or excuse me, RAID 5, you lose the net total of one drive, but RAID 6 is going to cost you double that because you're storing double parity. So it becomes at a reasonably high disk cost. And then our last answer choice, which is also not correct, is to say that it has a faster normal read speed than RAID 5. And that is inaccurate. Um, it has the same level of read speed as RAID 5 does, because there's no computation involved in just reading the data. So reads don't involve having to generate any parity. They don't involve having to write any parity or reconstitute data from the parity. Um, so just normal everyday read for RAID 6 and RAID 5 are the same thing. All right, two more questions are done. Enjoy them. See you next time. Bye.